Okay, welcome back. <clears throat> um, we were looking at uh, mental health as a particular issue that we wanted to look at for uh, in in particular areas of counseling. We were looking at mental health. Um, we just did a bit, bit of a brief introduction, and I'd just like to go into a few more details about what is mental health, what are symptoms we need to be aware of, the general um, kind of disorders that you see, and as people who are uh, who are going to be in ministry, people who are going to be helping others, we need to also have some kind of an awareness of what mental health is and what is it that we can do. Okay, so as uh, the World Health Organization has uh, reported, um, the definition that they bring about is that mental health is a state of well being in which the individual realizes one their own abilities, they're able to cope with different stressors that come in their life. They're able to be fruitful, they're able to be productive, and also in turn contribute back to their community. Okay. Um, moving, moving ahead to, to also look at um, certain facts about mental disorders is to know that, um, you know, this, these are basically statistics for us to see, is that it can affect anyone, the men, women, children, rich, poor. It's common. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the statistics do show that at least one in four, um, uh, uh, one in four people in the population in general uh, can can have a diagnosable mental health issues. And yes, one in five adults. Um, the fact is that uh, you may really not know that someone has a mental health dis uh, disorder. Um, they don't look very different from others. There may be only certain conditions that you are able to make out that there can be a mental health issue. It can range, when, when you're looking at mental disorders, it can range from something that's very common to something that's ext extremely severe or something that's very mild to something that's really severe. And mental health disorders, uh, it's not just about people feeling that they are stressed um, it's a little bit more than that. Their inability to cope with regular day-to-day -day functioning, uh, the fact that, uh, that there are issues in their relationships, it's it's uh, you will find that there are conditions in their physical health, uh, physical well-being or physical functioning that is being affected. Mental health conditions or disorders can can range from it being brief to it being long term. Uh, it can affect different areas of life. It can affect uh, people's work. It can affect people's relationships. It can affect uh, the way that they see the world and see life in itself. Um, mental health, uh, mental disorders can cause stress on uh, on the entire family, on a community um, at large, also. But uh, the fact is that there are effective forms of treatment in mental mental when there are mental illness. So when we're looking at uh, how do you uh, how do you label or understand what a mental mentally healthy person can do? A mentally healthy person can think clearly. They're able to build very strong relationships. They're able to cope with whatever stressors that there are in life, different challenges that come in life. They're able to cope with it. And they are able to contribute and work in a community that they live in. This is how you would understand that a person has, uh, has a, a stable mental, mel mental health. Okay? Um, when you're looking at uh, mental wellness, there are nine signs of good, of good mental health. Um, it, like, like we were talking about, mental health is the way, um, mental health influences the way you think, you feel, and you behave in daily life. It affects your ability to cope with stress, overcome challenges. Uh, it affects uh, the ability to build relationships. Um, it also affects the ability to recover from certain setbacks and hardships. So strong mental health is not just the absence of mental health problems. Being mentally or emotionally healthy is much more than just being free of depression or fear, uh, free of anxiety or any other psychological issues. Um, it, it refers to the presence of certain positive characteristics like, you know, there can be a sense of contentment, uh, a zest for living and the ability to laugh and to have fun, the ability to deal with stress, bounce back from adversity, a sense of meaning and purpose, 
uh, to learn new skills, to adapt to change, having a balance between different things, between work and play, rest and activity, the ability to maintain good relationships, uh, the place where one can be um, uh, confident and have a sense of hope and optimism, uh, the ability to, to uh, let go of of uh, painful issues to be to be grateful to have a sense of humor so there are there are many of these things that you would see that helps in once uh, a person's mental health uh, issues okay um yeah so what is mental health it's when there is a ne negative impact on the way somebody thinks on the way somebody feels and the way they behave so these are the three major components to it uh, that you know how a person thinks how a person feels and how a person behaves so if you were to look at certain signs uh, how do you recognize certain signs what are the symptoms of mental illness so there can be illogical thinking they are not able to process their thoughts in a in a way that is helpful um, that's what we, we say when it comes to thinking. There could be problems in thinking or having clarity in the way that someone uh, someone thinks. And as a result, it can affect their behavior. You will see a decline in their functioning, either at work or office or school. There will be a decline in it. Um, there, and uh, a lot of them come under the emotional patterns. There's nervousness or there's high anxiety. There is different shifts of mood huge forms of mood swings, um, there is apathy or, or a loss of motivation, a loss of trying, being extremely sensitive. Okay, And this affects the behavior where there is changes in the patterns of sleep, there's withdrawal from people, there's withdrawal from the responsibilities, there's withdrawal from even personal interests that they have. And you would notice that there is a decline in the functioning. So these are some of the symptoms that 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 you would recognize okay what are some of the warning signs and and this i think it's important for us to know to understand um when 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 does someone actually really require help so it like like it's like it says yeah it's not very straightforward and uh, because you can't test it like the way that you can test a blood sugar or a um or a heart condition the, there are certain symptoms that that helps you see whether they are going through a sense of mental illness so some of them are are uh, defined here but not all but at least this gives you a good idea so some of the warning signs are if there are if if there are reports of someone feeling sad withdrawn for more than two weeks uh, straight right then you would uh, that's when you know that they need help. So there are times we all feel sad, we all feel withdrawn, depending on some circumstances. It may go on for a period of time, maybe a day or two or three, but then uh, you're able to bounce back into normalcy. But if there is a significant sense of sadness and feeling withdrawn, then uh, uh, there are certain signs of mental health issues. Okay, the, the fact that uh, someone may try to harm or end their lives or even making plans, they're planning to uh, end their lives or uh, attempt uh, a suicide that's when there again it's a warning sign or someone who has out of control risk taking behavior that causes themselves harm or self to others like those who may be um, in uncontrollable abusive substance abuse where they they they're not able to um really discern whether that kind of a behavior is being helpful or not or there can be fear that is sudden fear over no reason um and there is there, there is absolutely no cause uh, that they are able to say or or you know which which can be um clubbed with with some physiological responses like uh, palpitations of the heart discomfort or a difficulty breathing when there's significant weight loss or gain that's again another warning sign or they are able to see hear or things uh, believe things that aren't real and this is what we call as hallucinations where they they feel people are talking to them or talking about them now this can also be a sign of mental illness so sometimes we 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 shouldn't confuse this with um with evil spirits that they that uh, you know people are engaging with evil spirits so we've got to be careful and discerning in understanding what is um uh, uh 
being demon possessed and what is it that is that is mental health or mental issues okay excessive use of alcohol or drugs is another warning sign more changes in the mood changes in behavior significant changes in mood behavior um uh, even in the in the personality is is again another sign or extreme difficulty concentrating um uh, not able to uh, put attention to the tasks that are given or uh, even worries or fears that get in the way of daily activities so these are certain again signs um, that we need to be careful about now i've just listed uh, taken a, a snapshot of a, of a picture that lists different kinds of mental health disorders i'm not going to go into any of this but uh, uh, you know if you are interested I, I would suggest you do up some reading to really understand this now among the major mental health disorders in this um, category over here is what we would look at as mood disorders. Mood disorders are what you would say there are, um, you know, people who go through um, uh, um, episodes of maybe having extreme high mood or extreme low mood. And that's what mood disorders are a major mental health disorder. Psychotic disorders, the things that you see below that, are disorders where they are outside of reality, all right? They are, they are not in reality and they perceive, think, uh, things that are very, very unreal. That again is, again, a major mental health uh, disorder. Neurocognitive disorders uh, is more organic uh, in, in the result, which means there is some neurological disturbances that causes these kind of disorders. And usually neurocognitive disorders um, definitely require medical help or medical interventions. Okay, The other um, addictions, addiction or disorders is also can become major when someone is addicted to a substance. It can actually cause psychotic disorders or it can actually cause mood disorders in itself. There are other disorders, what, what is called as minor mental health disorders. Um, and, and all of the others form under that category that's post-traumatic stress disorder after a certain trauma like uh, maybe a catastrophe or a natural disaster or war or a personal um, uh, uh, difficult traumatic event they're having a certain stress disorder that can come as a result of the stress anxiety disorders having a sense of generalized anxiety anticipatory fear over everything Somatic disorders. Somatic disorders are things that they continue to feel that there is something uh, significantly wrong in their health. And uh, uh, there are symptoms that, that they may bring about explanation to saying that it, it could be a serious um, physical issue. Personality disorders. Personality disorders are the way that uh, people's personality um, are uh, are at are at a problem because they find it difficult to associate with with different things in life and different relationships. Usually, personality disorders uh, come up largely in the midst of a relationship that you know people have personality disorders. Obsessive compulsive disorders is uh, the obsessions of um, certain repetitive thoughts obsessive thoughts that continue to keep coming that causes distress, making them compulsively act on a certain uh, certain behavior. That's, that's again, uh, what we look at in minor mental health. And dissociative disorders is where um, there, there is, there is uh, uh, it, it isn't a representation of what is, um, what is wrong, but because of psychological disturbances that are there, there are certain conditions that, that act out. Then there are eating disorders and um, eating disorders uh, where uh, a lot of lot of the disorders relate to relate with food and the and their relationship with food. Okay, so these are some of mental health disorders. And um, uh, it, 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 you know, if you are interested more, it would be nice to just read these up to understand at least a few symptoms of how you can recognize some of this. Now, when we look at mental health conditions, I remember um, let's not always look at either the person is mentally stable or the person is mentally ill. We see it in a continuum. 
and uh, um, uh, so there are different stages right so initially there may be very mild symptoms uh, and later the 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 greatest stage is someone there's someone who has symptoms that are persistent and very severe that it affects their life the idea of getting help is to ensure that you know they they come down that that continuum you know into a more stable health so even a person with uh, with some symptoms uh, of of uh, maybe low mood or symptoms of uh, uh, mild sadness um even though they are at at a at a at this side of the spectrum that doesn't mean they don't need help they also do require help so that it doesn't move up that continuum right it's to ensure that they get back into a more stable more functional state okay something that uh, we need to do uh, is how can we reduce the stigma that's attached to mental health the first and foremost thing is to be able to educate ourselves about what mental health is and especially because we are um, in the uh, also in in a place of ministry to also be very sensitive and careful about how we we um, uh, approach and how we Uh, help others with mental health issues so educating yourself builds up a greater understanding of it it is to and to show love and compassion to those who are mentally ill and not to stigmatize them not to keep them away um because of fear of how to respond it's good to talk openly about mental health and that's something we must do because it's so much intricate into our well-being Uh, not to stereotype people with mel- mental illness to be respectful when you're talking about mental health and and being able to role model so how do we support people with mental health and and for all of all of us who are as part of um, ministry it's it's important to understand how do we do that so one of the things that we um, we do is like we said you know it's important to get educated to learn about the uh, the illnesses it's also one is to be able to face your own fear and that sometimes you know to understand what do we think about mental illness do we do we um, feel afraid do we feel that uh, you know there is there is a sense of uh, uh, unpredictability that's there is it demonic um, so to really understand for ourselves what is it that we are f- uh, fearing and bring it up to you know those fears to god and ask god to actually minister and help you to see this in a better light okay uh, to be able to also see that uh, these kind of mental health problems uh, is something that is seen in the world around and uh, also to know that as believers and christians we are not exempt from that and uh, and and to be sensitive about the fact of how we we see mental health we help those with mental mental illness okay and also to be able to accept love those who are mentally ill to ensure that you know you see them as people to see to see them as people who may need your help be, need your your um understanding okay um what else can we do the the other things of course is uh, uh, to be able to encourage them to get support and help that they need uh, ensuring that even as we are praying for them uh, uh, deliverance praying for healing all of them always encourage that they get any kind of help if if there is a possibility you know going with them for an appointment um, making that uh, that first step of of showing that you care and helping them speak with someone who is a mental health professional and also to be able to access other kind of services that that are there all right uh, apart from that it's it's also to to see how um, maybe uh, uh, as as a person who's a minister maybe there are certain limitations on your part because you don't know how to what to expect what to do and and that's perfectly okay it doesn't mean you need to know everything it's just it's just uh being alongside with them uh empathizing with them being patient with them uh, working alongside with them is all that is required and when we are not able to manage something getting the help of a mental health pro- professional to work with them is is good getting family uh to to help the person or you know sitting people in families to ensure that they can best help and not be in a place of judgment or a place of uh, um uh um in a place of criticism while someone is going through that okay and continue to support and stick with them 
even as they are receiving this kind of help. Because uh, very often we do see, especially I think among our Christian community, I've noticed that people find it hard to seek help, even to talk to somebody um, about mental health issues. There is a fear that, you know, whether they would be seen as someone who doesn't have enough faith or don't believe in the um, bigness of uh, uh, in the goodness and the bigness of God. But then as as those of us who are in a place of ministry, to be able to be patient and kind to, to them, even as they are going through the process of getting help, uh, getting support, getting prayer, um, working alongside them. It's, it's important to just stick with them and see that they are supported and they're helped. I think another thing is also connecting them uh, in the most sensitive and confidential way to other people who may be going through the same kind of issues so that there itself they can, you know, mobilize support and strength for one another. Okay. All right. Uh, is there any question over here? Any, any, any thoughts, any questions before uh, I move to the next, uh, next part, which is marriage and family? And this is some quickly, just some observations and what we could do. Any questions? that I could uh, bring up. No questions? Just a, just a question. Have any of you all uh, come face to face with people facing mental illness? And maybe how have you dealt with it? Just maybe two, three minutes of uh, just hearing from you as a learning experience for others. I'm sure you, uh, all, all of you all would have met with someone who's had some of these conditions we spoke about today. So any any thoughts? How did you deal with it? What have been your reflections? What did you do? I think uh, bipolar disorder, uh, uh, people who are affected with bipolar disorder, when they speak, um, we would just maybe patiently listen to them for a long time. That is one of our experience. Mm -hmm. um, and assure them that we would be available in, in case if they want to talk at any point of time. Mm -hmm. And also encourage them to continue taking the medications if they are taking um, and pray with them. That's that's what the phase we are in right now. Good. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's a great place to be. Just supporting, helping, uh, being with them patient that's that's wonderful right okay good all right so i'll move on to the next one which is um another uh, area of uh, uh, issues that we do see common issues that we see in counseling is marriage and family okay uh, i know you'll have a course in marriage and family and uh, um there, there's an entire uh, you know the, a lot of chapters that we discuss over there. Here we're just looking at common issues that generally would come in families and couples. And as, as a counsellor, what are some of the things that you need to deal with? Um, so certain issues that you would often find uh, uh, being presented to you is, um, and, and if you are, if you opened, I'm at page 43. Uh, I, I don't have a slide for the slides for these because they're, they're very brief and as, as it's written here. It's basically to know that because people are different, uh, that the people in the marriage are different, couples, are, uh, personalities are different, there are bound to be co conflicts. There's bound to be um, differences in the way that they communicate. Um, there are there are going to be differences in the way they deal with their personal finances, in the way that they deal with uh, with uh, how they respond to crisis and uh, stresses, and how they work together as a team. So the so you may see couples coming to you for help in communication. Um, in order to be able to support one another in 
different responsibilities of life. Um, people may come with uh, conflicts over money, uh, conflicts over parenting, conflicts over um, over uh, 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 infidelity, having you know there may be adultery in the in the in the relationship and coming as a result of that. Uh, other kind of things are yes, issues of divorce, separation. Uh, illnesses, uh, as because as a result of mental or physical health issues, there can be uh, me mental health or physical issues, there can be disturbance within the relationship, there can be personality differences, maybe one person in the marriage has a personality disorder, and as a result, there are common uh, uh, conflicts that arise. Um, there could be unex uh, uh, unmet expectations that come about, and as a result, causing disillusionment within within the family, within the marriage. Um, other other issues of addictions, uh, infertility, you know, problems with in-laws, uh, financial bankruptcy, um, uh, housing issues, uh, issues with jobs. So there can be a whole lot of concerns and issues that come about, and you would see even when you're looking at an extended part of the family is the kind of issues that children or adolescents face. Um, so like we said, one big part is mental health among children, right? People, children with anxiety, children with um, uh, mood disorders, with psychotic disorders, with OCD, all of this definitely require help um, uh, medically also. Apart from that, you will have uh, children, adolescents um, facing um, uh, school school challenges, uh, either inability to cope with uh, challenges at school, with anxieties that come up as a result, with uh, pressure, peer pressure, with difficulties in learning. Now that's that again is another uh, you know another whole um, um, whole department of of um, learning disorders. You know, children finding it hard to write, to read, to do mathematics, to spell, all of that come under learning disabilities or uh, or any kind of anxieties that come about, separation anxiety, um, phobias, or even the uh, inability to um, finding it anxious to go to school. Uh, so all of that comes under stressors in, in school. Now, then also when it comes with children and adolescents with regard to their families, um, having parents who may be in continuous arguments where there's separation that's happened, where there's divorce that's happened. Um, there may be a ma mental health, mental illness among one of the family members. It can be death. There can be um, uh, uh, transitions at the job, transitions at work, uh, uh, you know, moving to different cities. All of this can cause uh, family stresses. There can be behavioral changes that you see in children having issues in their conduct, uh, being uh, deviant uh, or defiant, being very oppositional in the way that they behave towards their parents. So these are some things that you would see among children and adolescents. Adolescents, it's a greater, it's another area where, you know, as, uh, as the children develop into adolescents, that stage of life, having to cope with, uh, being able to cope, being able for parents to begin to see that the children are growing up, there is a need to build identity, there is a need for them to build into autonomy and the kind of issues that come about uh, from that from that area. So when, when we're looking at working or dealing with you know, multiple people in counseling, so, you know, counseling with one individual itself is hard enough. Imagine when it's coming with multiple people, you know, you're, you're trying to work with each person in the family without being, without taking sides, without being judgmental, without uh, uh, providing advices, uh, it, it can be, uh, it can be something that can be a challenge, okay? But there are certain guidelines if ever you are attempting to, uh, to, to have family uh, counseling or you know, sitting a family together is to know that every family member who is coming there uh, needs to feel secure in your environment. So, for example, let's say in a family where there is infidelity, okay, or adultery, that maybe one of the family members um, 
uh, is in an adulterous relationship and you may have the parents as well as the children sitting there uh, the even the adulterous person there or the member of the family needs to feel secure in that place right because you're you're there to help and support the entire family not join alongside with the rest of the family to pounce on the person okay so that's that's not the idea so one of the things that uh, it, you know it, it's very important to do is while you're sitting in a family counseling is to be a keen observant of what you are seeing as the inner dynamics that's happening in the family right and and uh, just by body language just by the way maybe their seating positions the way that they talk to one another the way that they avoid looking the way that they look all will give you a better understanding to see um, what is the inner dynamics of the family, who's um, pairing up with who, who's against the other, what seems to be the relationship with one. So all of this can actually just be observed by uh, by, by taking a little bit of time to observe, um, you know, uh, uh, physically with your eyes through your vision what's actually happening in that in that uh, uh, in that space the counselor over here is not a referee you're not there what you're not there as a referee neither are you there as a mediator which means avoid um being the middle person where you're taking information from one spouse or one family member into the counseling of another family member you're not the mediator that's not your job uh, in fact, uh, something that I, I generally do is avoid having personally personal sessions with one person. If it's a family session, everyone comes together. Unless, of course, you know there is maybe one-off need where there is one person who's maybe very distressed, and you may need to show a little bit of support to them individually. Unless that that's there, you tend to keep that as a where you're not there as a referee, not there as a mediator, you're a facilitator. You're helping open up conversations. You're helping um, others see what what are the maybe the perceptions that they have towards the other person. So you are there as a person who is facilitating the communication, facilitating the way um, uh, solutions can be come up to. Okay. Uh, also through a counseling session. It's important one is to find out what is uh, the goals and the objectives of the family as they're coming in for counseling. So that's the first thing you need to determine is because each of them may have different goals, right? In the sense of one person may say, okay, I want to uh, ensure that I change the person. The other may say, no, I want to work on the relationship, right? So it needs to be something that you come to a common goal. So the, the important question maybe initially to ask is as part of our counseling or as part of this meeting, what do you want to see happen uh, you know, at, at the end of these sessions? So that actually makes them to think about what is it that they would want to build up and coming uh, and, and you know, listing. Okay, these are some of the goals that we would look into and let's start to explore and uh, understand and then coming into action. OK, um, it, it's important that that each member of the family who's meeting with you should develop that sense of trust with you without feeling a sense of alienation um, from either from you as a counselor or from somebody else, someone else. OK, uh, and, and that's important to do, to be able to build the trust and the, uh, the fact that, you know, also confidentiality that whatever is discussed will continue to be there and that you will not take this outside of discussion. That's why I meant, you know, when you're meeting families, never to meet them on an individual basis, because it will almost feel that the other person seems not part of that entire process. So to continue to do that by um, together as a group, okay? Uh, uh, helping the families to, one is to really change the way they behave with each other. Okay, to be able to uh, to bring about the importance that every member of the family has a role to play in that relationship. Here, it's uh, especially in a family setting, it's very important to get each member to personalize the problem, to come to a place to see where is it, what is it that they're contributing 
that can cause uh, uh, that can cause the issue, right? So, uh, so they need to come to a place of saying that this is where that they will uh, they will do something that's going to help them help the end the 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 whole system of of the family. Sorry, can you just give me a minute and just just a minute. Yeah. So, um, uh, so, so to end, to what we're doing is to ensure that the the, uh, the once they personalize the the issue, um, we work alongside with them to change, to help them change behavior towards one another and towards the entire uh, uh, to, to the entire family. All right. Next is. Um, even as you're sitting in the in with the family, uh, to be able to draw wisdom and direction from the spirit to to uh, to know how to proceed, to be able to create that sense of oneness. Uh, often, you know, especially in in situations where uh, couples come together, where uh, families come together, um, uh, I have personally seen. There have been many, many deadlocks, right? I come to a deadlock because there isn't a way to proceed, but to really, and that's the point you draw from God and say, God, I need direction of how to how to proceed. What is it that I can do to create um, uh, this oneness over here? Uh, give me the ideas or give me the understanding on how I can move forward with this. So just being able to get the wisdom from God, direction from the Holy Spirit. Now, when it comes to um, you know, especially a couple of a Christian couple, and and uh, you know, establishing goals there, it's it's helpful to bring them back to Scripture. And I would say um, more than uh, more than um, what what you you like to probably do or, or something that I'd like to do is to bring about scripture and say, okay, this is what scripture says about the way um, maybe some issue in in this relationship is how do we think we can live out the scripture? So rather than being in a place of advice, letting the word of God speak to them so that they are able to come to a place of understanding how they need to proceed. So, uh, especially for couples or, or families who are in who are believers, to be able to draw out from Scripture uh, and and bring that back to them, so that they are able to think and understand as to how they they can move forward. Okay, so uh, even even as we we looked at all of these methods, um, remember that working with individual, working with families, working with couples, in itself can be draining, can be sometimes um, um, uh, not very rewarding, but it actually matters just that you stand as a support system for the couple in itself can be a huge sense of help to them. Encouraging, uh, praying, uh, um, um, giving them a space to talk, giving them a space to actually communicate in itself is a huge source of help for them, right? If there are times that you're not able to handle it, it would be best to get the support of someone who can who can maybe um, work in a more detailed, in a more intricate way with them. And usually we say that a couple or a family session, uh, at least you need to have a couple of months of having those sessions to see some bit of change, right? And the expectation that within the first or the second meeting, things will change, um, that that may be too lofty an expectation, right? So to ensure that they take that help, so encouraging uh, a couple or a family to take that help over time, to stay patient, to stay through the course, is something that uh, we as ministers can do, okay? All right. Um, we have 10 minutes. Uh, I'd like to open this up for uh, for any questions you all may have 10 minutes of any questions the class has been extremely quiet except for pastor john 
I think Divya, Divya and uh, Jeffina. Jeffina isn't here today. Yes, yes, uh, Paul. Yes, Pastor. I I heard you talk about the issue of not meeting partners separately because we are not mediators. But to me as a person, I think it is very, very important because at times there are things the other partner would want, not want the other one to know. Okay. Yet you as a facilitator, you you need to be aware of it so that okay. you, you bring it, it into light. So that's mm -hmm. why I see at times it may be important that uh, that separate mm -hmm. meeting is, is important. There are certain things you need to know. Uh, mm -hmm. Although you'll keep them confidential, you need yeah. to know about the other partners. So Sorry, Paul. But during the facilitation, you, you, you try your best to see that that issue has come out. Okay. Yeah. So you're, you're right that there may be certain, certain information that may not have come out in the session, which probably uh, the person would like to... Um, would like to uh, tell you that's good um but i think we should be careful not to get into the position of being the one to relate whatever that sensitive topic to the to to the other partner that's something that we should avoid doing because um, uh, uh, you know that there can be remember communication can always get tarnished through a process so I personally don't follow that method because I think it it adds up one accountability for every member to build that relationship. If they want to share something with me personally, yes, I permit that. I mean, like I said, in some cases I do do that. If they want to share a certain information, I do do that. But I don't I don't encourage it too much. So personally, that's my personal take on it. Um, but if you see that's working for you. That's well and good, but being careful, not being the mediator, not being the advice giver for either one of them or um, uh, the, the person who, who comes to a place of calling out, you know, someone else's fault when someone is saying, like, for example, you know, maybe uh, the husband may, may say, you know, this is ABCD thing is what my wife, is, wife does, okay? But she will never tell you that, right? Um, so then now maybe next in my, my counseling with the wife, I'll say, hey, you know, you shouldn't be doing ABCD things without any context of it. So, so I've got to be careful that I don't become that mediator, that I empower and equip the couple to be in a place of openness and honesty, because that's what I would like, that they come to a place of honesty. If there are certain sensitive matters that do not um, matter to the counseling session, then you know, we can let it rest and let it lie if it doesn't impact the current marriage. Like, for example, let's say a person says, a husband comes in and says, I'm having an affair with somebody else and the wife doesn't know about it. Now, this is not something that can be, uh, that can, uh, yes, it is, I, I have to keep it confidential, but it's not something that I will encourage that the husband stays in that 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 part so he's saying you know I, I want to continue this relationship what i want to build on that now that in itself is very skewed you know it, it doesn't uh, it doesn't work that way so we've got to be careful about how um uh, we, we need to equip uh, our counselees or our or, or the members of the family to come as much as honest as possible to a place of restoration all right so yeah, but but thank you, thank you, Paul, for for sharing that. Anybody else? Any other question? Any other thought? Any comment? Anything? Okay, I sense there's nothing. If there isn't, then I think we can we can close. We're five minutes uh, to class, but we can we can close. Uh, if there aren't any thoughts, any questions. Okay, all right. Let's just pray together, and uh, we will we will um, wind up. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, God, that uh, you have brought us to places of influence and impact. God, there are many things in the world around that people face, challenges people face. God, and sometimes we feel quite ill-equipped to deal with these things. 
But God, we know that your wisdom, your knowledge, your power is there backing us. Give us the understanding that we need. Lord, give us the desire to know better. Father, to be able to take knowledge and use it, Lord, for the help of your kingdom. Father, even as we meet broken people, broken relationships, God, that we would only do things that are sensitive in the spirit. Lord, to show others that we love, we care, we support, we want to build up. Lord, we pray, God, that you will work in and through us. Give us every wisdom we need, Father. Lord, we rely on you even as we work with people. Lord, our ministry, God, is with people, is with difficult, challenging uh, people with problems, people with, with concerns. Father, and we ask, Holy Spirit, that you give us the right words to speak at the right time, the right counsel, even the humility, Father, to be able to refer, to be able to move them to someone else who may be able to deal better. Thank you, God, for teaching us, for helping us. May we all, Lord, have a discerning spirit. Give us, Lord, uh, that, that uh, spirit of wisdom, spirit of discernment as we work alongside your, your people. Thank you for each person, Lord, in class today, for those who have not been able to join. Father, we pray for your mercy and your grace over them. Thank you once again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you all. We'll meet uh, next week. Thank you very much. God bless. Thank you, Pastor.